Microsoft has a major conference next week, Sony announced some news, and Surface hardware, well, it's here, sort of. Happy Friday, friends. It is the Friday before a major conference in the Microsoft world, which always means there's lots of stuff going on. If you know what's coming next week, well, it's Microsoft Build. Build is the developer conference for all things Windows, application development, Visual Studio, if any of that makes sense. There's going to be a lot of news coming out next week about that type of content. Now, if you're looking for Xbox developer news, I don't think that's going to be on the horizon, but be looking out for things like Windows development, Office development, uh, Visual Studio, enhancements, backend services, enhancements, and all that sort of good stuff. It is Microsoft's first, I believe, only digital streaming conference. I'm sure they've had smaller events, but this is all online for obvious reasons. Um, typically, otherwise, I'd be getting on to a plane uh, for Seattle this weekend, but we are not, and sadly, I'm going to be staying home because I will miss my friends up in Seattle. But there is going to be a lot of news. Uh, you can keep it locked to here. Uh, just follow me on Twitter, at BD Samson. You'll be able to stay updated on what is going on. Otherwise, let's get into what happened this week before we start looking about what's going to happen next week. Microsoft announced yesterday that they, that they bought Meta Switch. Meta Switch. If you don't recognize that name, you're not alone. But they are a, a respectable name in the deep networking technology sector. And it's going to be, I believe, tying into some of their 5G mobile initiatives. So just be on the lookout for that. Pricing was not announced Microsoft never does that unless it's a major acquisition, but Microsoft did snatch them up. If you've been looking to buy some Surface hardware, well, it, most of it, most of it is now available. You can now get the Surface Go 2, the Headphones 2, and Earbuds. Now, all this stuff is available. I don't actually have earbuds or headphones here to tell you if they're good, bad, ugly, or indifferent. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out is because I know a lot of people listening to this do use Teams, and now I'm a very heavy user. I used it for a year, but now, anyways, we'll talk about that later in the podcast. I'm using it all across the board. Is that the earbuds and the headphones are not Teams certified, which is a little odd because Microsoft has this massive communication platform that's competing against things like Slack and Zoom. And well, Teams certified headsets from Microsoft would make a lot of sense. But here we are, and they're not. And even more befuddling of the waters, uh, the Surface earbuds were actually pitched, if you remember, to, hey, like, hey, you can advance through uh, PowerPoint slides and deep integration into Office 365. I even wrote an editorial that Microsoft was trying to use Office to sell uh, uh, basically the Surface earbuds, but they're, none of them are team certified. Now, why is that? I believe the technical reason is that team certification for headsets, they have to have certain buttons and features such as like mute and volume up and volume down. And some of these things don't actually have that. It's a little awkward for Microsoft that these things are technically team certified considering how much of a push there is. But hey, if you're trying to use the expense account to buy some team certified hardware, these things don't fall into it. It just seems like it would have been like an easy win for Microsoft to say, hey, look, these things work and here you go and bada bing, bada boom, we'll sell some more hardware. But there you go. If you want to go buy all that stuff, you can go ahead to your local store, or more than likely local store's website, and get that stuff delivered. Uh, the Surface Book 3, which I'm using right here, and there's also an unboxing video on this channel, is now, well, you can pre-order. It is not available, I believe, until maybe, I think next week. Next week. Same with a bunch of the docs as well, so keep all of that in mind. Uh, I'll have a lot more thoughts on this bad boy right here, and bad boy in a, in a, in a good way, but Good, you know what I mean, um, because I, I do quite like it. It's a pretty safe update. Uh, Microsoft Family Safety apps are now available in preview. If you've been waiting for that, more than likely you haven't been waiting, but um, the sam the you can now go grab those apps in preview um, if you would like. Well, actually, I believe you got to sign up and then see if you get you know the lottery draw or whatever. But they are coming. They are coming. So and then like I said, next week is build, and there's going to be a lot of news. A lot, a lot, a lot of news. This is a major event for Microsoft. Aside from the news. It's going to be interesting to watch from a technical perspective how Microsoft is going to approach this because, like I said, this is their first major digital all-online-only event. They did have their MVP Summit, but that is going to pale in comparison to how Microsoft is doing Build. This is a, a big public-facing event, and I'm sure they are going to be working nights and weekends leading all the way up and through that event to get everything aligned. It'll be interesting to see. I think it's worth to say uh, you might want to give Microsoft some slack, not not that Slack, but you know, Slack, if things 
things don't go perfect because this is going to be interesting. And, um, and we know that this is a challenge because companies like Google, Google just straight up canceled IO. Uh, Apple's uh, developer conference, they actually pushed it back into late June. And Microsoft is the only one, the only one who kept to their roots and said, we're going to do it on the day we said we're doing it. And that's just what we're going to do. So that is happening. On the gaming side, uh, there's a couple things here. First off, I was really excited about this announcement until I looked at it. Uh, PGA Tour 2K20 was announced. I'm a big golfer. I like to golf. I'm terrible at golf, but I like to golf. And I also like to play golf games. Um, this is a complete and total letdown. What PGA Tour 2K20 is, it's if you're familiar with this genre, there's a game called The Golf Club 2, which you can go play and buy right now. All they did was they took that game and put and basically licensed some PGA Tour names and courses and then just updated it. The graphics look like 2014-esque like it's it's i believe uh the golf club 2 might have come out in 2017 something like that like the, it, just go look at like their hype video which is so cringeworthy um because the graphics look so bad the swing mechanics just look disjoint the, the swing mechanics look like me on a golf course which is not how justin thomas will swing a golf club so anyways uh being just a big letdown of that. On the PlayStation side, Play Sony announced that PlayStation 5 is still on track to be released in 2020, which is good news, which means we're going to have the Xbox Series X. Uh, we're going to have the PS5. It's going to be a good gaming holiday season. Now, every time I do an earnings report on Xbox, people always just kind of dump all over. They're like, Xbox is just doing so terrible. They should just kill the brain. So to keep things level setted, uh, the PlayStation Sony as a company announced, uh, they had a 57% drop in profit to 337 million in revenues on 13 or on 16.35 billion in revenue. Sorry. I think I said that backwards. 337 million, uh, net income on 16.35 billion in revenue. So 330 million is what they put into the bank. Microsoft put billions of dollars into the bank every quarter. Um, lifetime sales of the PS4 though did pass 110 million. Um, that is down though, like hardware sales, again, no surprise on anything. Hardware sales continue to fall off a cliff for consoles because who's gonna go out and buy a PS4 right now? Who's gonna go out and buy an Xbox Series X right now? Knowing that all this stuff is on the horizon, it just, it, it doesn't really make sense. If you're really that anxious and you have zero consoles, then just, then wait, like, I think that's kind of your best bet because just save your dollars. You're going to be able to get a great console here uh, in the near future from either Sony or Microsoft for that matter. Also, Unreal Engine uh, started showing off all of their sort of next gen sort of title looking games and stuff. It looks great. And I can't wait to see what it can do on the Xbox Series X. Um, it's really hard to describe how great it looks on, on a podcast, but you can go find those videos on the interwebs and you will see the dazzling ray tracing effects and just how things are progressing progressing from current gen to next gen. And as always, Unreal, I think, has a pretty strong history of kind of overhyping some things, but I think this will be a good look at where things are going. Let's dive into the questions. I'm going to refresh the thread. I always tweet that out uh, every week, and that's where people drop the questions. And so here we go. Pathalga says, is it possible Microsoft cannot get Win32 container technology to work? Will they keep the Met well, Metro apps, is the name I haven't heard about, Metro apps around for another mobile initiative? It seems like they should put more effort into making mobile apps for Windows 10X and possibly a single screen phone. It doesn't seem like there has been much initiative and interest in Microsoft relating mobile software in general. So you're not wrong that there hasn't been a huge mobile push for Microsoft because they don't have a mobile platform. There's no, there's no, it's not coming back in the way that people wanted to come back. Windows Phone is dead. Microsoft's mobile initiative lives on a little thing called Android now. I mean, we know that from the duo. The duo is coming. All these executives, Chris Capicella showed it off. Brad Anderson showed it off. Frank Schausman. If you're a C-suite exec at Microsoft or a corporate vice president for that matter, uh, you are probably have a service duo and are just flaunting it on Twitter, which is whatever, frustrating. Just send us one, guys. Um, just show us. Just release it. Come on, give us hints. Anyways, uh, back to your point. It is possible that they are having trouble with Win32 container technology. I mean, it, it, when it, it, that's not an easy thing. If it was easy, it would already have been done by now. I don't have definitive information on whether or not that app, that sort of model is not working out. I think last I heard was that it was progressing. It's obviously complex and all that. And maybe that's part of the reason why that they are slowing down with Windows 10X. But at the same time, I don't think there's a huge rush because Windows 10X isn't going to suddenly revamp and, and, and move 10 million more PCs in a quarter. It's just not it's not that big of a shift for the end user that they will just flock for adoption to it. So um, will they keep Metro apps? I don't think technic 
technically speaking, I don't think Metro apps are still around right now. Um, they do have UWP apps, obviously, which are the evolution of Metro. But we also have already seen in some of the build catalog, build is again the conference next week, one of the sessions is talking about an, a new framework or something called Reunion, which we will learn a lot more about, which sort of sounds like not good news for UWP, but we will find out. We got to, you know, let's wait until we get all the news before whatever. Uh, data miner says, um, recently analyst Michael Proctor said the, f and the former head of Xbox, Peter Moore suggested the Xbox series X should come out at 399 to undercut Sony. Uh, some believe this is impossible given the tech, but given there are more ways to monetize games through such as game pass and game pass and games as a service and everything else, uh, is Microsoft uh, have the ability to do this. I think everybody would be very happy if the Xbox series X came out at 399. Can Microsoft do it? Sure, they can. They will absolutely take a loss on the hardware sale at that time, right? It, Microsoft is going to have to sit down and make a decision. They're going to have to say, do we want the best possible chance at growing market share, uh, which would be 399 or do we want to at least break even on the hardware and then try to grow it, you know, organically through other means? That is a decision Microsoft is probably wrestling with right now. They're probably doing the math saying, ah, if we come out at 399, we're going to get X, Y, and Z advantages, but then we're going to lose on the revenue side. The question is, is willing, is Microsoft willing to take that loss to help grow the, the, the base of the Xbox? The other side of it is too, is will that help grow Xbox? It's certainly not going to hurt things. I mean, if you go look at two consoles and the Sony's whatever, more expensive um, for parents who are new to consoles, they're like, hey, we're going to grab the cheaper model. That is very much a real scenario. Now, if you have $200 invested in PlayStation 4 games, are you going to go buy an Xbox Series X because it's $50, $100 cheaper? I don't know the answer across the board for that. It might be tempting because you're going to get more power and everything else, but you know, that's a, just because a console is cheaper doesn't mean it's going to have a massive explosion in sales, especially given the current environment. Uh, because imagine yourself, like my, I have several hundred dollars invested in Xbox games. The PlayStation five could come out at a hundred bucks and I would still have trouble probably buying one simply because I'm not gonna have any games on that side. I'm gonna have to go rebuy everything else. Now, if they solve that games problem, getting people to move back and forth might be a bit easier but we will see um as for the pricing i think that's all speculation uh, by those two former people nobody has the real answer phil spencer probably knows roughly what they're going to do but microsoft may not know yet right there's a lot of talk that microsoft is waiting for sony to make the first move on pricing we'll find out we will find out here soon enough hey brad uh Turner Kit here says, long time ago, you wrote about Pegasus, Centaurus, and Andromeda. I know that Centaurus is Surface Neo, Andromeda is Surface Duo, but what was Pegasus? Is that some kind of Surface, uh, some kind of new device that was supposed to be Polaris that was canceled? So I don't quite know what Pegasus was. Um, my guess is that it could potentially have been a smaller uh, Surface Neo is my sort of understanding at the time that they did have obviously the Android version, which is the duo that we know now, but I believe that there was a Windows variant of a device that size, and that may have been Pegasus, but I'm not, I'm not positive on that. Uh, Vladimir says, I have another question. He says, um, let's see. How was the transition to Teams for First Ring Daily? I record interviews on Skype with three to four people and managed to get an independent video feed and an split for every caller. I didn't find a way to do that in Teams. Do you know if it is possible? Um, it will be possible eventually in Teams. We'll find out uh, maybe this week or next week when that is coming. Um, but it has been actually pretty easy because I, I have some back-end stuff that I can do to, to rip those video feeds, um, sort of a pri proprietary thing for, that we have established for First Ring Daily that makes it possible. But for those who aren't familiar, I do a podcast every single day with Paul Throck called First Ring Daily. And I use this podcast studio to record all of it. And we had been previously using Skype. We are now using Teams uh, to record the video and audio. And then I can do the mixer switching. I actually have a stream deck on order, uh, which will replace this little doodad because things are getting more complex and I need more buttons. And I think a stream deck will be the right solution. And so uh, the transition has gone pretty well for, for podcasting so far. 
So uh, his other question is, says, he says, uh, do you think that the Xbox Series X will support Bluetooth audio? It would solve so many problems. It absolutely would. So there's the, the challenge potentially that I've heard is that the Bluetooth audio and Microsoft's own proprietary protocols for the controller aren't really all that friendly to each other. Now, Microsoft has some sort of audio solution up their sleeve that I've heard about, but I don't quite know what it is yet. But it's pretty clear that they are being quite intentionally quiet about how they are approaching this. So we don't know. The one thing I'm really hoping is that they do bring Dolby Atmos support to the headphone protocol and however else they do it. That is one thing I am hoping, uh, but we will see. We will see how that all shakes out with their Dolby integration across their headsets and, and all that good stuff. But I don't, I don't quite know yet. Uh, Robin says, I use Chrome for most of my online activities, Firefox for Facebook and Legacy Edge, and yes, in IE. And many times I have discovered, for example, that I went to Nordstrom with Chrome. I found that there was a Nordstrom promoted ad in Facebook and Firefox. I thought cookies and histories in browsers were independent. I want to learn more, but what I don't know. So here's, this is a, a very good question. So here's the challenge. People want to retain online privacy, so they have multiple browsers using for different things. I completely understand this. What I'm guessing here is that you're you're assuming that because you looked at let's just say Facebook and Firefox that all that content should be retained within Firefox it unfortunately does not you need to look up your IP address more than likely the advertisers are tracking you by your IP rather than the specific browser that you are using which is a much more dirty and less fun way of tracking your online activity they've seen this IP address go to Nordstrom and then you fire up a different browser they don't care they see it's the same IP address so they're going to serve you ads because they know it's more than likely the same person now how you get around that would potentially be using a VPN but that's not going to be a perfect solution either but that is how they are tracking you. Um, just for simplicity's sake, you can honestly probably use the same browser just all day long. Switching between browsers anymore is not an effective way to avoid online targeted advertising. It does help in some scenarios, but as a blanket statement, it doesn't really matter anymore because advertising uh, technology has gotten smarter than using cookies and tracking you that way. Uh, hi, uh, Brad says, Brad, Bart says, hi, Brad, two questions. Uh, what sessions at Build are you looking forward to and why? So there's a, a bunch that I'm looking forward to specifically related to the office stuff, looking forward to the team's announcements that they have coming. And also it looks like there might be some fluid framework announcements. Um, those are piquing my interest at this time. And then it was briefly online. I think Microsoft may have pulled it. I can't remember if the union session is still up. Uh, those are, are what I'm looking forward to right now. His second question says, what other sessions would you recommend? Well, recommending is a bit tough only reason because everybody has different priorities like if you if you need to learn more about the latest features in visual studio well then you should go watch those sessions um, if you want to learn what's coming and what's next for some windows stuff then you should go watch the windows session or microsoft 365 i will say the one thing that is not being talked about at build at least to my knowledge is windows 10x which is a major letdown so uh, Dave says, hi, Brad, uh, do you have any new info on the launch of teams and the password manager as part of Microsoft 365 to end users? Good question. So this was announced, uh, when they announced the Microsoft 365 name conversion for the consumer line. It also was part of the sort of family app that was announced in preview. We're not getting it until the summer. And I think the full rollout is not going to be complete until the fall. So we've got some waiting to do, and we still don't have a really good look at the password manager yet. It almost just seems sort of like a secured list rather than saying like a true password manager, like from LastPass or one password, unfortunately. Uh, second question, any idea uh, what app Microsoft will use as a contact manager on Surface Duo? I assume that they will have their own context and their own ecosystem instead of Google. Uh, but where and how? We haven't really heard. This is one of the reasons why we, we know Surface Duo is coming, but there's so many questions that we don't know. For example, how contacts are going to be managed. We don't know the battery life. We don't really know anything about the camera specs. Um, we, we don't even know the update strategy yet for Android across this thing. The best thing you can do now is to go download the Microsoft Launcher from the Android store and then, or the Google Play Store, whatever it's called this week. And then you can actually get a pretty good idea of how Microsoft is going to manage contacts and everything else like that. That's gonna be their model, I believe. Uh, Felipe says, hi Brad, hope you're doing well. Felipe, I hope you are doing well, my friend. Uh, I have an enterprise question this week, fantastic. We all know that everyone is moving to the cloud and most of the companies are moving away from uh, moving 
their applications from Windows to Linux, containers to Kubernetes and all that stuff. Considering this scenario, what do you think to be the future of Windows Server? Fantastic thought because we're going to get some looks at potentially how Microsoft is thinking about it this week at Bill. The one thing I want to hesitate with this is, yes, people are absolutely moving to Linux containers and Kubernetes. You are not wrong. Microservices are huge right now, but there is still a massive cash cow that is known as Windows Server for on-premises operations. And even Windows Server technically runs in the cloud. I, I know there's some minor differences in there, uh, but Windows Server is not going away anywhere anytime soon. I think Microsoft, the future for Windows Server is to continue in, to increase its hybrid cloud scenarios, I think is the massive investment that Microsoft has made uh, last year. And I believe that is, I'm trying to remember explicitly what they said, but I believe last year was a hybrid cloud, uh, massive push. And I believe that is going to continue this year for the server enhancement. So that is realistically the future is to try to break down the walls of what is on-premises and what is cloud. And that is where Windows Server will, will live. I don't think Microsoft is ever going to, I mean, we've seen them do things like Nano Server and some other crazy things, but Windows Server as a whole, I don't believe is going anywhere anytime fast because there are still a massive install base of people using it. And the licensing on that stuff is very expensive and Microsoft makes a lot of money from it. So there you go. That is that is what I've got. Uh, oh, Chevelli says, what do you think about the unifying UWP and Win32 applications? Now, I'm going to get some flack for this, but I'm still firmly in the camp that UWP as a platform is dead. Uh, Microsoft will not say that because there's reasons why they won't say that, right? It's sort of embarrassing on um, one aspect. It came out, I believe UWP started with Windows 8 around that timeline, right? And then Microsoft said, everybody should be building UWP. This is the future of Windows. And now here we are in middle uh, or the first half of 2020 and nobody is building UWP applications um, per their original definition. Microsoft has really molded and modeled um, UWP closer to Win32 and it's lost some of its pizzazz of what it was supposed to be when it was first announced. Now, we will see here at Build how Microsoft pitches whatever this reunion is about how Win32 and UWP, but it kind of sounds like the name itself says, hey, it's a reunion. So it sounds like maybe more UWP features are coming to Win32. Let's assume that that is the case because why else would it be called reunion? Um, whatever. If that is truly the case, then why would you build a UWP application? It, it, it really hurts that narrative. I, I don't think UWP per se is ever going to go away, like what we would call a UWP, but what developers will actually use will not be a true UWP. I think Win32 is just gonna continue to grow up and adopt more UWP solutions. And Microsoft has already sort of like talked about that. This isn't that, what I just said right there isn't really new. Win32 continues to add more UWP functionality. And I think we are going to see an aggressive move more towards that um, here potentially. So uh, we will we will discuss the, oh, and he actually says my username is Mark. Uh, and he says piggybacking off of this. Uh, do you feel, do you have a feel yet for how this is going to impact emulation on Windows 10X? I hope they're, uh, da, 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 how would this impact it? Well, it would potentially make it easier if you have, it could be, there's so many unknowns about this that I don't even want to say it, it. My gut says it should make it easier because micro, if Microsoft is building new libraries to make this happen, they should be building it with the mindset that emulation is part of that model, which should make sense and should be how they're developing. There's a major caveat that we don't know enough about reunion yet to make a truly educated statement on how it is going to impact 10X and the containers and all that stuff. So this is why next week is so interesting to me is because we're not gonna get, you're, you're not gonna hear next week that, hey, Windows 10X ha has uh, whatever XYZ features. What you're gonna hear is something exactly like this. You're gonna hear how Microsoft is approaching the developer framework for its upcoming apps and services and distributions and all that stuff. And then we have to work sort of the narrative out of that model and says, this is how Microsoft is telling developers, what does this actually materialize on the front end? And that is where the fun comes into a developer conference. And if you like having fun, you can hit that subscribe button because we will all be here back next week talking about what was announced at Build. Have yourselves a wonderful weekend.